All right, everybody. Well, thank you so much for coming today on this Father's Day Sunday. I really appreciate your, you guys showing up today. Um, I'm excited about this one. I know my mom is too. Um, this is uh, continuing on with studying the book of Nehemiah. Uh, we're now at the point where Nehemiah is uh, building, starting building the, um, you know, rebuilding Jerusalem with the gates and, and the walls, and he's facing opposition. Um, now, opposition um, you know, is inevitable. Whenever we're facing or going, working towards God's dream for our lives um, and God's purposes for our lives, opposition is inevitable. It's something that we will encounter. It's just a matter of when. Um, this is one way to know that we are on the right track is when we are facing opposition. Oftentimes the enemy will, will try to, uh, you know, throw darts at us because he knows that we're a threat. And so he'll do everything he can to try to get us off track. So, um, you know, sometimes people think, well, if it's meant to be, um, you know, I'll get a sign if it's if it's, you know, it's going to be smooth and then that's a sign that it's this is the right path. That's actually the opposite. Um, perfect conditions, uh, especially perfect conditions with pursuing God's dream for our lives. It's unrealistic. It's not it's not realistic. God wants to prepare us for for rocky for rocky waters, for ups and downs and and, and resistance, um, you know, with unexpected uh, obstacles and adversity. This is the things that he wants to prepare us for. So we can learn a lot from that in studying uh, Nehemiah chapter four, which we're going to be looking at this week. Um, God is wanting us to grow us in our pursuits, um, you know, for, for whatever it is in our life that we're pursuing. He wants us to grow up to become more like Jesus. And as we get closer to Jesus's return, it is said that we will be insulted we will be scoffed. Let's look at uh, 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 3. It said, it is important for you to understand that in the last days, scoffers will make fun of you while they do every evil thing they desire to do. So Christians will not have it easy. Um, you know, we, we, they didn't have it easy before. They're not going to have it easy as we get closer to Jesus's return. But we have to be prepared. Um, and for me, I'm all too familiar with what it feels like to be insulted. I was bullied constantly as a kid. And, and this type of experience of, of being scoffed and ridiculed and being made fun of, uh, it can be very traumatic for, for people. It can be very traumatic for kids. It can be very traumatic for even us as adults uh, when, we're, when we're insulted, especially by those that are close to us. Sometimes it happens. Um, but even recently, last week, um, you know, I was actually insulted even recently, um, about a week and a half ago, a good friend of mine, um, he actually uh, ridiculed me for, for teaching God's word while not being ordained. Um, so that was one thing that really hurt. And I, I went through that a, a week and a half ago. It really, it really shook me up. And then even yesterday, when I took my daughter to Knott's Berry Farm, uh, I went to the bathroom and she was in line. And so I was going to you know, meet her in line. Um, somebody accused me of cutting in line. And they were upset at me, accusing me of cheating and trying to cut in line. So, so we face insults, we face ridicule, and so did Nehemiah. He he faced it um, as well. So, um, you know, for me, I wish I would have handled both occasions uh, better. Um, I did not turn the other cheek. I actually got upset. Um, you know, I got offended, and so that's something I need to learn from when studying this uh, message today. I need to really take this message in for me personally. So we can all learn from this message. Uh, bottom line is because opposition is inevitable um, as we get closer to pursuing God's dream for our lives. So let's look at Nehemiah chapter 4, 1 through 23. So we're just going to give you like a little preview of what uh, Nehemiah, the opposition that he faced. Um, and we're going to cover these in more detail uh, in this message. But so how did Nehemiah face opposition in Jerusalem? So um, I'm going to show you how. And then my mother in the second half of this message is going to look at how he overcame it and how we can learn from overcoming that as well when we face opposition. So bottom line is Nehemiah accomplished something in 52 days that no one accomplished in 90 years in Jerusalem. So this is incredible. So we can really learn from Nehemiah, but let's look at that opposition. So it says in Nehemiah chapter four, verse one and seven, that he uh, faced rage. He faced rage from, from those that were non-Jews that were threatened that what he was doing, that didn't wanna lose their power um, so they, they acted out in rage. Um, it also says in Nehemiah chapter four, verses one through five, it says he faced ridicule. He faced ridicule. Um, you know, to ridicule basically means uh, to, you know, to make fun of someone or, or, or to do something in a cruel or harsh way, to be mean or unkind, right? To give mean or unkind comments or behavior. That's what exactly what Nehemiah faced and the builders faced. 
Um, and then it also talks about racism and resentment. We find that in Nehemiah chapter four, one through two, and also uh, verse 12. Uh, racism basically means prejudice or discrimination or antagonism directed against a person or people on the basis of their membership in a particular racial or ethnic group. So this, this happens all the time. This happens now. We face this now in our culture. Nehemiah also faced resistance uh, in Nehemiah chapter 4, uh, verses 7 through 8, and also in chapter um, 10. You know, resistance basically is the refusal to accept or comply with something or to attempt to prevent something uh, by happening by action or argument. So that's exactly what Nehemiah and the builders faced. And then finally, it says that he faced rumors in Nehemiah chapter 4, verses 12. And rumors, as you know, uh, are uh, you know, stories that circulate um, you know, to, to report uncertainty or, or doubtful truth. And so you know, they're basically trying to undermine and, and spread rumors about Nehemiah and his motives. So these are all things that you can find in Nehemiah chapter four. You know, one of my favorite movies is A League of Their Own. My daughter loved, was watching this the other day, and there's a particular line in this movie that really stands out to me. It's when uh, Tom Hanks, he said this to, I think he said it to uh, Gina Davis's character. He says, it's supposed to be hard. If it wasn't hard, everyone would do it. The hard is what makes it great. So we have it hard when we pursue God's dream for our lives. It's not easy. It's not smooth. God is with us. He wants to grow us. He wants to strengthen us. There's a reason why it's hard. There's a reason why we get resistance. You know, the harder the obstacles, the more sweet the victory, right? Um, but we're not in this alone. God is with us and he wants us to have the support of a team for us to accomplish it. And that's how he wants us to do it. So how people uh, try, how people will try to stop you with ridicule. So we're going to learn five ways that people will try to help or try to stop us with ridicule, five different types of ridicule. Um, and so the reason we want to start with this is because we want everybody to be prepared with what to expect. And then we'll give you the, the solutions, the antidotes on how to combat these things. But again, we're going to be looking at Nehemiah chapter four for these references. So the first one is people will attack your character and identity. People will attack your character and identity. So as I mentioned, this happened to me uh, a week and a half ago with a friend of mine. And, you know, my character, uh, he basically was telling me that, that I shouldn't be preaching God's word unless I'm ordained, right? Unless I'm ordained and went to seminary school. He thinks it's sacred and it is sacred. God's word is very sacred. Uh, but he told me that I should not be uh, doing what I'm doing unless I'm uh, ordained and, and go to seminary school. Um, you know, he, I understand his point. Um, you know, God's word is sacred, but, you know, God also calls us to be ministers, and he also calls us to spread the good news for everybody that, that follows Jesus. He, and, and this is my way of doing that, right? Um, you know, my character and my identity were being questioned, and it hurt when he made that comment. Um, and this individual told me to, he basically said, don't quit my day job. That's what he told me. Don't quit my day job, which is job development. Don't quit my day job. And, um, you know, that was, that was a hard it was a hard thing to take, you know, because I really um, feel God has led me into doing to doing this and to, you know, and it's hard for me to talk. It's not easy for me to 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 speak like this. You know, I get nervous every single time I su I suffer from social anxiety. So this is not exactly something that I really like. You know, um, it's easy for me. Right. It, it, I've had to go through a lot of challenges um, by doing this. Any type of speaking engagement is hard for me. So um and then also yesterday, the Knots guy, you know, in front of my daughter, you know, he accused me of trying to cheat and cut in the line ahead of everyone else. So my character and I, my identity was being questioned and I, and I, I took it, I took it hard and I was, I was offended by it. Um, you know, this type of things, when this happens to us, when our character and identity get challenged and people attack it, it can hurt us to our very core. Let's look at Nehemiah chapter four, verses one through two. It says, when Sanballat heard we were rebuilding the wall, he became very angry. He flew into a rage and ridiculed the Jews. To his allies in the military of Samaria, he said, what does this pathetic bunch of feeble Jews think they are doing? That's hurtful. That's very, very hurtful. Pathetic, feeble, labeling their religion. These are things that people tend to do when they're upset, when they tend to upset. They do they, they, they do what's called low blow, right? In MMA and, and even in WWE, there's a term called low blow. 
It's an illegal shot to the groin area that causes your opponent immense pain and they fall to their knees, right? Um, it happens in MMA all the time. And actually in MMA, the referee gives the person five minutes to recover. So because it's such a low blow, it's such a really horrible wound. It's a hard blow for, for somebody to have, right? And in the same way, we have to allow ourselves time to recover with God uh, when we are healing from these low blows uh, that we get, from these deep wounds that people uh, throw at us, right? Um, especially somebody that's close to us. It's even, it's even worse when it's somebody that we're close to, that we trust, and they say something like this. You know, they attack our character and our identity. Uh, whether they mean to or not, it still hurts. So the second one, the second thing that, the second different ridicule that we tend to face is people will accuse you of evil motives. So just like, you know, the, the character and identity being attacked, this is really just as painful when they start uh, telling us that we have evil motives, like they know our motives, like how do they know our motives? They don't know our motives. But Nehemiah had to face this. Nehemiah had to face these accusations. Let's look at Nehemiah chapter two, verses 19. It says, they said, what are you doing here? Are you rebelling against the king? So as we know, Nehemiah had got permission from the king, Artaxerxes, right, uh, the Persian king, um, to go there and to do this rebuilding project of, of Jerusalem. But he also got his protection, right? And he also got his provision, which means he got the supplies, the lumber that he needed to, to, do this, um, to do this endeavor, right? So this was a false accusation that Nehemiah's enemies were saying that he was rebelling against the king. No, he was, he was working with the king. This was the king's permission, right? He was going with the king's will. Um, but Nehemiah's enemies wanted to shake him up with this false accusation, as, as ridiculous as it is. Um, you know, he probably also wanted to get other people to believe these lies as well, right? So in Nehemiah uh, 4.2, it says, um, are they going to restore it for themselves? So he's basically accusing Nehemiah of going outside the king's will and rebuilding Jerusalem for, for his own sake, for his own benefit, which, which we know wasn't true. So this is what happens. People tend to question our motives uh, when we're trying to pursue something for God and, and, and with God, um, we will get these type of accusations, which leads us to the third one. People will exploit prejudices against you. People will exploit prejudices against you. This happens all the time. This happens when people uh, are fearful, right? They're fearful of what they don't know. They're fearful of some, somebody that's different or a group of people that are different from them, right? Uh, the enemies of Nehemiah, they used racial slurs in the book of Nehemiah. They weren't Jews, right? So they were using slurs uh, of, of a group that were different from them. And politicians, even today, you know, they um, this is the, they use this trick as the oldest way to rally a crowd is to get wow. votes is to, to help feed the fears of people and to and to and to do this. And this is how they can rally. So this is like the oldest trick in the book. Right. Or this is how you get votes. This is how you get people to rally for something is you start feeding their fears. Right. And that's basically what what they're doing here in Nehemiah chapter two. It says when Sadballot and Horonite and Tobiah, the Ammonite and Jeshem, uh, Jeshem the Arab heard of our plan. They made fun of us and laughed at us. So, you know, this Palestinian conflict goes back 2,500 years ago, right? When the Jews were allowed to return after 70 years of captivity, the non-Jews that were residing there during that time didn't want the Jews to return. Let's look at the next verse in Nehemiah 4, 7 through 8. It says, when Sanballat, Tobiah, the Arabs, the Ammonites and the Ash Ashdodites heard the repairs they started. They were very angry and plotted together to stir up trouble against us. So, you know, it's no longer the critics of Tobiah and Sanballat. Now there's more people. Now there's the Arabs, there's the Ammonites, there's the Ashdodites. There's, there's a group of them now. They're conspiring together, uh, more than just a couple of critics. So in this verse, you see four different racial groups are mentioned here, right? They're organizing their opposition, right? Sanballat, he was Sumerian, and Samaria was actually north of Jerusalem. Uh, the Arabs were actually south of Jerusalem. Tobiah and the Ammonites actually lived east of Jerusalem, and the Ashdodites lived actually west of Jerusalem. So literally, Jerusalem is surrounded by hostile neighbors all around them, just like it is today. 
this is what happens, right? This is what's happening right now. So they have enemies all around them. Um, you know, negative people often rally together with a common enemy. They seem to attract each other. They seem to find each other. If they have a common enemy, they seem to come together uh, to stir up trouble. Um, you know, what does it say? The enemy of my enemy is my friend. So that's basically what's happening here. They're rallying together uh, to conspire against um, the, uh, Jerusalem. So have you noticed that it's easy for people to rally against something than for something? All you have to do is go online on social media and you'll see so many people against everything. They're just against this, against that, but they're never for anything. It's rare you find somebody that takes a stand for something, you right? So, um, which leads us to the fourth one. People will make up lies and stories. People will make up lies and stories. You see this all the time, especially in the media, especially with news, um, especially in politics. The more popular somebody gets, the more and the more they stand for something, the more enemies that they'll have to make up stories about them. You know, when Rick Warren wrote The Purpose Driven Life, um, he was targeted so much. I remember that book just came out. He was targeted. Uh, media outlets, um, you know, famous comedians were making fun of him. Uh, just it was just nonstop. Um, and so I, he was Rick was mentioning that I guess somebody had tried to write an autobiography about his life um, that didn't even meet Rick Warren or even talk to Rick Warren. So of course he's skeptical with what they're going to write because they have no have no facts. They didn't even talk to Rick. Um, and this individual that tried to write this book, the only other book he wrote before this was a bi autobiography on Paris Hilton. So <laughs> he really wasn't qualified to write about Rick Warren. But this is what happens. This is what happens. People tend to make up stories and they spread lies and they, you know, this is just what happens, especially on social media today. There's, there's a, um, a websites like snopes.com that are, that are out there right now that, that uh, you go to to try to fact check a lot of these articles and a lot of these made up things that are, that are out there and, you know, the internet right now. So um, we have to definitely question a lot of these things, that, the information that we get nowadays. Psalms 38, 12, it says, those who want to hurt me uh, plan trouble for me. All day long, they think up lies. This is David talking here. They repay me with evil for the good I've done, and they lie about me because I try to do good. So just like David went through this, Nehemiah went through this also in the builders. Um, they tried to make up stories that the Jewish builders uh, would not complete the wall or would try to complete the wall in one day and then worship afterwards, which is basically ridiculous. There's no way they could do that. Um, let's look at Nehemiah chapter four and two. It says, do they think they'll finish the wall in a day and then offer sacrifices to their God? So of course that wasn't true. They just made it up, right? The fifth one is people will predict your failure. People will predict your failure. This is to me, probably, I would say one of the most common ones, especially as you're telling people about your God-given idea or, or goal or dream, something that you want to accomplish, you're going to have what's called naysayers, right? When you make your idea public, they're going to predict your failure. They're going to tell you that it's not, it's not realistic. It's too risky. Don't do it. But if God wants you to do it, who are they to tell you anything, right? Um, some people believe that they're even helping you by telling you that you will, you will not succeed. They don't want you to, to waste your time or money or effort into something. That's what they believe. Um, but they're forgetting that if God wants it to happen, it's going to happen, right? So the Bible says in Nehemiah chapter four, verses two, it says, do they think they can bring burned up stones back to life from those heaps of rubble and rubbish? There was a lot of rubble. There was a lot of stuff there that they had to clean up and, and rebuild, right? And so in this, in this example, the naysayers were basically telling the, um, the, uh, you know, Nehemiah and the builders that they're just wasting their time, basically. It's not going to happen. Um, but naysayers will always be around, right? Naysayers will always be around. There's a large group of them out there that are always uh, saying that this can't happen or that can't happen. You know, I remember Rick Warren in his uh, sermon, he was telling a story uh, when he was about ready to start Saddleback, and he hadn't even moved to California yet. So he was trying to get some advice. He was trying to get some information and he wanted to get some inspiration and talk to some leaders. So he talked to a well-known uh, leader. He didn't say who it was, but somebody we all maybe would know um, before he started his uh, trip to California. And this person told Rick, he said, California is a graveyard of churches. 
that he would fail, right? It would be a failing endeavor uh, to not even start it. You know, he was trying to warn him not to start it. Well, of course, this guy was wrong because right now Saddleback has been around for 40 years. So they're celebrating their 40th anniversary. So there's, he, you know, people don't know. And the naysayers, they just don't know. They can't fortune tell. Only God can do that. So, you know, but it's something to be prepared for. In Nehemiah chapter four, verses three, it says, then Tobiah, who was standing close by, joined in. Right. What they're building is so weak. It will collapse if just a fox tries to walk on that wall. Have you ever had somebody try to predict failure with you or even a specific failure? Like they're telling you specifically how you're going to fail in the future. Have you ever had that happen? I'm not sure if any of you have ever had that happen to you, but, but it does happen. Um, but always remember when that happens, remember this. The enemy is always right behind influencing people, the naysayers in our lives. He's in, the enemy is trying to influence them uh, to, to throw us off our track with these negative comments, right? It happens all the time. So we have to prepare ourselves for these type of ridicules and these type of obstacles uh, because it's going to happen. And, and for me, who, who basically failed the past week and a half with ridicule, um, you know, I have to learn my lesson when it comes to these things too. I have to expect that I will face ridicule, even from people that I call my friend or even unexpected things like in the line at uh, Knott's Berry Farm, right? It happens. You never know when, but when it does, we need to prepare for it. We need to be close to God and, and, and allow him to, to get us to focus on him and not on the, uh, the, the naysayers or the ridicule or the insults. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this message. Um, you know, this was a timely message for me. I forgive me, Lord, for for not acting the way I should have. I, I took offense to these things, and I I could have acted a little more Christ-like in my responses. So I'm really grateful for this message because it really hits home with me. So, Lord, help to prepare us for for these type of attacks. Um, you know, whether it be attacking of our character and identity, or people accusing us of of evil motives, um, or when people try to exploit prejudices against us. They use our, our race against us or, or our culture against us. Um, Lord, protect us from that. Help us from that. Help us to see things clearly. Um, Lord, sometimes people will make up lies and stories or even try to pre predict our failures with naysaying comments. And, and these things can hurt, Lord. It can be very hard, often traumatic. Um, and sometimes even dividing relationships within families or friends when these type of things happen. So, Lord, when this does, help us to stay strong um, when, these, when this hurt, hurtful opposition comes our way. Um, help us to not identify with even the mission or the goal that you put, but rather help us to identify in you, in Jesus. That's where our, our identity is, not in anything else. Um, so, Lord, um, when we are weak, uh, help us to be strong. Um, when we're struggling, uh, when we're offended, help us to turn to you for clarity and perspective and healing. And help us to remember this the next time we face opposition. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, guys. So I'm going to play this song and then my mom is going to come up and, and do the second half of this message. Thank you, Chris, very much. Um, I'm, before I get to the first point on how should I handle ridicule and insults, I'm, uh, it's, I'm just being convicted right now, and especially with the story I just heard. One of the ways you can handle ridicule and insults is to really know God's word. And in this case, Jesus's last word was he told the disciples and all that were there at, on the mountain saying, go and spread the great commission, the great commandment was to go and commission was to go and spread the good word, the gospel. And I don't think the Lord would want to limit that to who's ordained or who isn't. So I wouldn't want anybody to be discouraged, anybody listening right now right now to be discouraged. I better not spread the word or, or speak of it at all if I'm not ordained or a pastor because I think that would be against God's will. So all I can do is anybody ever says that to you or anybody, you're not worthy of sharing the word or you don't know the Bible and you don't, you don't know the Lord, I would say, I would pray for those people. 
because God really wants us to share his word and wants us to share the good news. And I believe that from the bottom of my heart. Never be intimidated about sharing the love of the Lord. So anyway, how should I handle ridicule and insults? Your first one is tell God how it upsets you. Tell him how it upsets you instead of going to others and, and, and making them miserable or, or picking on other people, go to him. And when you go to him, pour your heart out. Say, Lord, I'm upset with this. I mean, let's, let's look at Nehemiah. Look how he prayed here. So I prayed, God, you can hear how they are making fun of us. Let their insults just fall back on their own heads and may they themselves become captives in a foreign land. Don't ignore their guilt because they have thrown insults in the face of builders. That's how he handled it. He had got, he, he, he prayed from his heart. He took it to the Lord. He didn't take it to anyone else and blame all these other people. He took it to the Lord. So when you ridicule, when you ridicule, don't take it to anyone else. Take it first to the Lord. Trust the Lord. And remember this. Again, this is the word. Greater is he who's in you than he of the world. That just came to me today. And I love, I love that verse. Greater is the Lord that's in us than the God of this world, which is Satan. Our Lord is much stronger and take it to him. Absolutely. And you know that that saying sticks and stones may, may uh, break your bones, but um, words can never hurt me. Well, they can't. But we can be protected by the Lord. That's why we take it to the Lord first if we are upset. Now, your second one is confidently state my trust is in God. Confidently state that. Don't quiver about it. Don't get into it. Confidently say, my trust is in God. I had a situation last night. This is the worst thing that my worst nightmare of uh, being in the desert. My husband and my doggy and I were out in the bungalow in the desert. We have a little home out there too. And um, what happened in 117 degrees? The air conditioner broke. Gone. We are dying. We don't, I, I mean, literally it's so hot don't know how we were going to get through the night. Uh, my husband's up all night feeding ice cubes to my dog to keep her cool. It was unbelievable. And I put my faith in the Lord. Trust. I trust in you, Lord. You're going to get us through this night. You're going to do this. And he did. That's the first thing I did. I didn't complain. I just, the Lord, and he got us through it. That's the one you go to first. That is the one. And in Nehemiah 2.20, it says, I answered them. The God of heaven will give us success. We are his servants and we will start rebuilding. He was confident. You see, ridicule can only stop you if you let it. I'm going to say that again. Ridicule can only stop you if you let it. You have the choice. You have the choice to let somebody down here of flesh knock you down, discourage you, insult you, make you sensitive, make you want to give up all around, or you go to the God, powerful, our creator, and he can, he can block those arrows. He can control the situation in your heart. That is your choice. And in Psalms 119.51, arrogant people mock me cruelly, but I do not turn away from your teachings. So you stay tuned to God's word, no matter who ridicules you. Stay close to the Lord. That's what you do. And you're going to have opposition. You are going to have opposition all the time. And, and, and here's, a, here's a great say, saying that I got from another pastor. It was on Facebook and I had to copy it. It says, your light is going to irritate a lot of unhealed people. It's automatically going to irritate them. If they're not walking with the Lord, they've got Satan in their head too. They got other things controlling them, whatever it is, your light is going to irritate them a lot. And remember that. And if you remember that, you won't take it so personally. You won't take it to heart. You won't say, oh, it's all about me. And they're attacking me. They're attacking your light. They're attacking what you might represent if you're representing the Lord. And to answer one uh, 
question. To pick up the cross is to follow Christ and be more like him. And sometimes that isn't easy. Maybe you just like to fade into the crowd or not be confident in the Lord or just get not get involved, those kinds of things, or not go out and spread his word or his good news. You, that, those people are not picking up the cross and following Christ. Your next one is be better than those who insult you. Be better than those who insult you. It's very clear. Romans 12, 19, 21. Dear friends, never avenge yourselves. Leave it to God for it is written. I'll take vengeance and I'll repay those who deserve it, says the Lord. Instead, do what the scripture says. If your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they're thirsty, give them something to drink and they'll be ashamed of what they've been doing to you. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil by good. So you're taking the higher ground. That's what following Christ is. That's a follower of Christ, not just reacting to what this world has to offer. The hatred, the insults, the no, the naysayers, all those things. It's following Christ. You are dancing, as they say, to a better drummer. You are following the Lord, a higher a higher realm. All right. And then in uh, Peter 3, 9, don't do something wrong to repay a wrong and don't insult back to repay an insult. Instead, repay it with the blessing. You're called to do this so that you'll get a blessing. Billy Graham had a great, a great little saying. I have to, I have to share this with you. It's absolutely adorable. So if you wrestle with a pig, both are going to get muddy, but only one will enjoy it. So if you wrestle with the pigs, if you get involved in this nonsense, this rhetoric, the insults, I get you, da, 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 all this stuff, both of you are going to get muddy, but only one of you will enjoy it. So that's something to remember. Don't even engage in these insults or tit for tat and all that stuff. Okay, let's go to number four. May God, make God my defender. Now, how do you do that? By tithing. It sounds like a big deal, but it belongs to God anyway. This is something we forget. If we get something, we think it's ours and we own it. But we're just renting it, literally just renting it. You give the first 10% of my income back to God and he claims his promise. We're just using this. Like my house right now, my house will not be my house in probably 20 years, whatever. It, it, it's not mine. It's something that we are allowed to have right now we are using it we have to remember that and if he's blessed us with something if he blessed you with a dollar give 10 cents i mean he could have said 50 percent. he could have said more but he just said 10 percent. and why because he's testing our faith he's testing our faith in uh, exodus 23 19 and 22 god bring the best of the first fruit of your harvest to the house of the lord if you do what I say, I'll be an enemy to your enemies and I'll oppose those who oppose you. Wow. Don't miss out on this blessing. Don't miss out on this blessing. Tithing is highly important. We are so sensitive about money and ownership down here. That's why he's testing our heart. So that's another thing that we can do to make sure the Lord is on our side because we trust him. He will be with us too. And then the last one here, number five, remember, I'll be rewarded forever. I'll be rewarded forever. In Matthew 5, 11 and 12, it says, blessed are you when people insult you or persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Be glad because your reward will be great in heaven. You should care about more God's approval than what other approvals are. That's what we should start be thinking. We're thinking more about pleasing the Lord than pleasing other people all around us because there's always going to be other people around us who say we're not good enough or why don't you do this instead or I would rather have you do that. And that is not what the Lord wants you to do. He has a special plan for you, a special purpose for you. And that's what we need to follow. See, on earth, we care more about things that won't last, things that just won't last. Solomon discovered that in the end. 
meaningless, meaningless stuff. He kept saying that he had everything. He had so many women, wealth beyond belief, wisdom. He had everything. And in the very end, he knew it was all meaningless. See, only the church will last because God is taking the church with him to heaven. This is the only thing that's going to last, the body of Christ. All of us that, that want to know the Lord, want to be together, loving one another. That's the only thing that lasts. So why would we want to waste our time with meaningless stuff? Meaningless stuff and meaningless statements to us that will knock us down and ridicule us and insult us. These are meaningless things. Stay close to the Lord. Remember, your light is going to irritate a lot of people, but keep that light going. Don't let the broken ones or the evil ones or the dark ones put out your light. That's your challenge, is not to let anyone put out the light that the Lord has given you, that we are representing. Okay, thanks, Chris. In the last verse, it says, 1 Corinthians, I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians 15, 5, 8. So my dear brothers and sisters, be strong and steady, always enthusiastic about the Lord's work, for you know that nothing you do in service for the Lord is ever worthless. Amen. Amen. Thank you.